If you have votes, you have to be in Oxford, or you can be anywhere. You have to be in Oxford. You have to be in Oxford. And I have to do it, an MPP, which is what I promised I'd Another MPP. Welcome, everyone. I'm Alberto Diaz Calleros, Director of the Center for Latin American Studies here at Stanford University. Um, welcome to today's Friday lecture, the intimate history, of, uh, on intimate history, enslaved women, religion, and the problem of the slave in quotation marks uh, by Professor Alexis Wells Ogomi. Uh, kindly note that because the lecture is going to be uh, live streamed, it will continue to be available for the public in our class YouTube page after this event. And also, please, if you are watching remotely, please submit your questions and comments to the YouTube chat, um, and we will make sure that our speaker can get those questions during our Q&A uh, at the end of the talk. I want to remind all of us here uh, that we are at least here at Stanford, we're in the land um, of the and the land and the territory of the Ohlone original people. We offer gratitude to the land, to the water, and to the air that surround us. And we want to pay our respects to the past, to the present, and the future Ohlone peoples uh, who continue to be uh, present in, in these their homelands and throughout their diasporas. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I will speak for a second about diasporas. Um, what we wanted to do in this quarter in our class seminar is do a little bit of a different set of uh, speakers and a different uh, series that would normally happen in a Center for Latin American Studies. And it is, uh, you know, really with, with great pleasure that I can uh, see, you know, at least already we started with a discussion about Martin Luther King a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and today we're going to talk about the U.S. South and um, uh, enslaved women in the U.S. South with, with uh, Dr. Wells of Ogomi. Uh, and the idea was that in some ways, you know, this is such a, you know, missing ingredient in a lot of our discussions of Latin America. Uh, the, the legacies uh, of slavery and uh, really some you know, longer view reckoning uh, with the issues of how to think about Afro-descendants in the region. And I thought that the best way to educate ourselves on this was not necessarily to just focus on Afro-Colombians or Afro-Brazilians or Afro-Mexicans, which, I mean, there is a lot of research going on in those areas, but I thought we wanted to learn about, you know, how people have been thinking about this for many decades already in other areas uh, of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so Alexis Wells Ogogomi is an assistant professor in the Religious Studies Department at Stanford University. She's a historian of African-American religions. Uh, her teaching and research examines religiosity of enslaved people in the U.S. South, religion in the African Atlantic, and women's religious histories. Her book, The Souls of Women Folk, the Religious Cultures of Enslaved Women in the Lower South, UNC Press 2021, is a gender history of enslaved people's religiosity from the colonial period to the onset of the US Civil War. She's currently at work on a new monograph that traces the gender racialized histories of quotation marks witchcraft as a social cultural category and loose connect collection of misidentified practices in the United States. Uh, she has also worked on some bold, uh, multi-edited volumes on documentary history of religion and slavery, as well as a comprehensive volume on new approaches to African-American religious history. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, welcome to class for Small Corner of Latin American Stanford. Thank you so much. Um, I, I am so grateful for the invitation and the opportunity to come to you in a hybrid fashion. I'm sorry I am not standing at that lovely podium that I can uh, see from my vantage point. Um, and I do want to say as a, a disclaimer that uh, I do have a, one of my children is at home with me. Unfortunately, the sitter got COVID. Um, so we are, oh, hi, there's everyone. Good to see you. Um, 
so uh, if there are any interruptions, we are all familiar with this moment. We are still in it, uh, especially those of us who have uh, younger children. Um, so I, I kind of, uh, to, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I think this is a wonderful place to start. In the interest of time, I'm gonna to stick to my script. Although given that introduction, I have so many other places I would like to go because I do think that um, this is a wonderful uh, juncture to think about the ways that histories of the Americas are entangled, um, especially when we pull back to the era that I'm most interested in, which is uh, the era of slavery and the onset of global colonialism um, and capitalism. Lot, many of these histories are interwoven, so we cannot uh, extricate the history of Brazil from the history of the American South. They are uniquely linked. Um, and we can talk about that more uh, in the Q&A because I, I did not, I, I, I missed my opportunity to just be geek out on that topic alone. Um, I, I wanted to kind of really think about the book and really think about some of the questions that I think are central and foundational to the study of the Americas more broadly. And especially as they relate to my area of expertise, which is uh, histories of slavery um, and religion. Um, so I start thinking by thinking about the, um, the completion of my book. As I was approaching the completion of my book, uh, The Souls of Women Folk, uh, as many people uh, in this room may al already know or are familiar with, some of you may become familiar with, uh, very soon, usually you have an editorial team that will ask you about your cover image. Um, and since the book was about the religious lives of enslaved women in Georgia and South Carolina, I knew that I really wanted to cover uh, a cover that attested to the complexity of bond women's inner lives, a cover that represented them, not as the one dimensional figures predominantly known as slaves. And I take issue with that um, term. So this is why it's always in quotation marks with me. Um, but uh, the one dimensional figures predominantly known as slaves in popular and academic historiography around the globe, but rather I wanted an image that depicted them as humans who experienced childhood, gave birth, raised children, and loved while enmeshed in one of the most brutal systems in human history. Yet as I went in search of these images, um, the images that I felt were appropriate to convey this idea of bond women's humanity, I was met with some very familiar and problematic tropes. Fueled by anti-slave trade and abolitionist initiatives, the vast majority of the depictions of bond women presented the varied abuses perpetrated against them at the hands of human traffickers and holders. A number of the images spoke to the voyeuristic sadism that threaded through abolitionist literature designed to represent the violence of enslavement while appealing to gender conventions surrounding women. So there were images <clears throat> like this one. Can everybody see the, the, the new image? Yes, okay, good, making sure. So images like this one depicting a Captain Kimber who was accused of torturing a 14 year old girl to death for not dancing naked for him were as salacious as they were heinous and appealed to a European and American and American thinking broadly um, fascinations with African and African descendant women's bodies and sexuality. Sometimes the sadism was not overt, but rather hovered just beneath the surface as evidence in this depiction of women being branded on the coast of Western Africa. While branding was not a popular practice as the slave trade grew in size and popularity, it was practiced by slaveholders on both sides of the Atlantic and spoke to the shift in status. And by that, I mean the understanding of enslaved people as human property that characterized slavery in this era. Punitive scenes also populate the slavery archive. And, and I think as I slide through these, many of you are familiar with a number of these images. Um, and I tried to stick to images that were um, kind of more native to the regions I studied, but honestly, these very similar images are populating the archives um, throughout the Americas. So punitive scenes populate the slavery archive, characterized by bond people in various states of undress, while slaveholders and others beat them mercilessly, usually for minor infractions. 
This enslaved teenager uh, in Richmond, Virginia was only 15 or 16 years old when she was locked in a room and burned repeatedly by her mistress for upsetting the mistress. She was apparently clinging to life when she was found. Images like these from those depicting spectacular acts of violence like this one to seemingly more mundane scenes of public auctions that punctuate contemporary articles about enslavement in the United States and the Americas spoke to the historical context in which enslaved people lived and breathed and continue to shape understandings of what it meant to be an enslaved person in the Americas, especially one of African descent. Scenes of violence, mutilation, humiliation, trauma overwhelmingly shape how we understand the slave. Therefore, after sifting through hundreds of images for my book cover, I ended up choosing this one, uh, Thomas Anschutz's The Way They Live, which was painted in West Virginia in 1879, over a decade after the end of slavery. Since the inception of the system that displaced and colonized humans in one locale for the production of goods in another, the term slave has been used to describe the persons whose physical, intellectual, and reproductive resources supported a rapidly expanding global economy. Though the discursive treatment of the persons bearing the designation has changed over time, the residue of its, sorry, you know I'm a religious study scholar, ontological significance persists. Enslaved persons often appear in scholarly and popular literature as undifferentiated, violated bodies who largely resided, resided on the periphery of historical processes until their emancipation catapulted them into the role of actors. That is, as evidenced by the images of bond women, their status as enslaved people marked them as those who were acted upon, often violently and with impunity. This, these types of omissions effectively render the enslaved almost inanimate, perpetually trapped within enslaved, the enslaved free paradigm in which varied forms of sociopolitical freedoms are requisite for personhood in historical memory. So the question that I would like for us to consider today is how can approaches that emphasize the study of the interior lives of bond people, in this case, bond people in what will become the United States, invite new paradigms for understanding racialized and gendered humanity in the Americas? And putting that a bit more simply, um, how might the religious histories of North American bond women humanize the slave in the collective storytelling of the Americas. So to begin our conversation about this question, I start uh, with an abbreviated visual journey through the history of slavery. The goal here is, um, excuse me for one second. Okay, that's fine. Just keep, keep watching the shot. That's fine. <laughs> okay. That's fine. <laughs> It's fine, son. Just, just watch. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, kindergartners are out for the next two, three days. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this person, and then I still have to go get my older child uh, right after this. So, life, right? Um, so, uh, to begin our conversation about this question, I start with an abbreviated visual journey through the history of slavery. And the goal with this uh, visual journey is not only to point to the historical conditions that character the characterize the lives of the bond people depicted in the images, but also to invite you to meditate upon the work of the images themselves, the work that they perform uh, in how we think about slavery. So with these images, I'm not merely trying to offer a visual accompaniment to the words I'm saying, but rather pointing to the relationship between history and historiography, how the images themselves are shaping our narratives about the lives of the people. Moreover, true to our topic, it's an invitation to really reflect upon the academic and intellectual enterprise, how our experiences uh, of what we're seeing, what we choose to see and what we don't see, our assumptions, guide the questions we ask about the people. Uh, 
From this visual journey, I moved to a brief consideration of the religiosity of, this, of slavery and uh, enslaved people and how attentiveness to the material conditions of the people centering their experiences, even when their voices are absent, can push back on categorical legacies of the one dimensional slave. So uh, here I'm saying, the, what is it? Did somebody say something or was that an echo? Nobody, okay, good, I'm sorry, I heard a, a little bit of an echo. Um, so here, of course, I'm centering the voices of enslaved uh, woman gendered individuals, which is uh, the sub, these are the subjects I primarily study, but I'm doing so to suggest how different reading practices can do the work of rehumanizing those who already knew themselves to be human. So I do wanna underscore this point, this is me as an academic inviting us as an intellectual community to think about what we do when we intellectualize and historicize these groups of people. But I always wanna keep, um, keep in the foreground of our minds the fact that they themselves did not understand themselves to be anything other than human. So this is a, it's, it's much more of a reflexive gesture than me trying to imbue them with anything. Um, it's about how do we narrate these histories? How do we tell these stories? How do we depict them? Um, and finally, I just want to end with a series of provocations that are less conclusions than ellipses as we think together about how the work of intellectual communities here, the university, the humanities in particular, can contribute to global conversations about race and how humanizing enslaved people can be another step in deconstructing the abiding legacies of anti-Black humanity and anti-Blackness um, upon which the system of slavery and contemporary racial hierarchies depend. Um, so a lot there. Uh, obviously, I will not elaborate uh, greatly on everything, but I do want to touch upon these topics because they're all things that preoccupy me, not only in um, the book that I wrote, it's also the book I'm writing and all the work that I'm doing. Um, so the system very quickly, I'm still a slavery historian, equal parts slavery historian and uh, religious historian. So I, I cannot um, take you into the religiosity and kind of invite you into conversations about these questions without really sitting with the material realities of what it meant to be an, an enslaved person. And so the system of course of transatlantic slavery did not begin in North America, but rather um, for our purposes, thinking about the Atlantic in particular on the shores of West Africa, uh, where bond people were often captured in uh, wars that were being manufactured as the slave trade picked up uh, by between neighboring polities and marched to the coast or rivers to meet potential buyers. The aptly named vigilante, which is depicted here, was uh, one of the many French enslaving vessels that continued to traffic humans after Britain ended the slave trade in 1808. Captured by the Royal Navy in 1822, there were 345 enslaved people aboard the vessel, which sailed from Nantes, the primary trafficking port in France. Uh, According to the Maritime Museum, which holds the record, the Navy captured six other French and Spanish vessels in the same raid, which attested to the slave trading powers dependence upon enslaved laborers for their success of their, of their American ventures. Um, and I want you to pay close attention to this, this image. Just again, what response are you having to it viscerally and then moving towards the intellectual of kind of what it's uh, trying to depict. So here you'll see males were generally shackled together. Let me look at the, you can't really see it that well. Um, but if you can imagine, males were generally shackled together using irons um, uh, shown in shown in here. Uh, you can see these, these irons here. Uh, while females and children were left unshackled on account of the reduced likelihood of insurrection. Both were generally kept below deck in the hold of a ship as evidenced by the historical rendering of the enslaving vessel, the Henrietta Marie. And I, I can't, I don't have time to show you the Henrietta Marie, unfortunately. Um, adult males and females alongside children were generally stripped of their clothing upon capture in the interior to rob them of any, of any cultural, religious, regional and status identifiers as they marched to the coast due to the potential for females in particular to increase the wealth of slaveholders via their agricultural and reproductive labor, 
Females were often sold into the West African or Trans-Saharan trades prior to making it to the coast where European American, um, US American, and uh, I, could, I could go down the list and, and specify Brazilian uh, enslaving vessels waited. Oh, here's the Henrietta. Oh, I do have the Henrietta Marie on here. There you go. <laughs> Sometimes I forget my own slides. Um, and see here, here, this is actually a better representation of what these cargoes look like. So you can actually see the layers here. And they would also carry other cargo, as you can see kind of from that other view. Um, and so that's how they were doing the exchanges. You would bring enslaved people on, unload cargo and try to create more space for more enslaved people or other goods that were being trans uh, ported around the Atlantic. Um, so when enslaved people did make it to the coast, they were subjected to barbaric acts like branding, which we already saw a depiction of, sexual assault, leering and physical torture. Uh, in this manner, an estimated 12.5 million people embarked enslaving vessels for a life of unfreedom in unknown places. Of the known voyages, only an approximate 10.7 million enslaved people disembarked. An estimated 2 million either died of willful or forced starvation, disease, murder, or suicide. And here, I want to show you a time lapse that some of you might have already seen. And I'm going to start it up. Um, and you can see here the year. And you will begin to see. Uh, dots you see starting very slowly here and i want you to notice where we're going because even though we cannot i cannot dwell too much or i don't dwell too much in this talk on the connections between what i'm talking about and uh the regions of the americas called latin america you see here the vast majority of people are going to ver those regions the overwhelmingly of course, Brazil is going to get the largest number of enslaved people of any place in the world with nearly 5 million going there alone. Um, but the second largest is going to be uh, the Spanish Americas followed by the British Americas. And so you have a large number. This, these histories are intimately linked. Also, places like where I'm from, if you enslaved people, Florida were very, very porous. And all along the, the, uh, the low country, you see now these numbers are moving very quickly. The low country was linked to the Caribbean very strongly because most of the people who started plantations there were, were actually planters from the Caribbean. And so as you watch this, um, I invite you to put a human face on those dots. <clears throat> to think about the 12.5 million human lives that had been disrupted by dislocation, capture, and sale. Thinking of the adults and children who folded their bodies into the holes of enslaving vessels, considering the fumes, the human excrement, the body odors, the tears, the confusion, the anguish, the fear that characterized this experience. And thinking it for my, our purposes of the girls and women who most often suffered the gaze, touches, and assault of the predominantly men who'd been at sea for weeks or months by the time they would get to the coast. There were people who gave birth in the holes of these ships, those who experienced morning sickness and miscarriages and feared for the lives of their children. And so here, why, as we looked at those dots, so oftentimes we see the numbers when we talk about slavery, but we are not really doing the, the hard intellectual, psychological and emotional work of attaching human life to the numbers. Um, and so if we, I want us to attach human experience to the 12.5 million number. And then of course, for our, thinking about uh, the, the connections with Latin America, if we pull out, the purview of that human experience expands further when we consider the mass death due to smallpox and other diseases of the Aztecs, the Arawaks, and the Tupi, uh, uh, most notably in Brazil, which catalyzed the turn to West African labor for the production of cash crops. And uh, again, thinking about these connections, that system, which was imported first into Brazil on the Brazilian coast, is being imported by Luso Africans and other Portuguese people who were off the coast of Western Africa in the Canary Islands. So this is all connected. 
all these systems, the cultures, the religiosity, the, the currents, the lives of millions of people are connected through these uh, various currents and historical moments and, and uh, economic and racializing enterprises. All right, so I'm gonna move from, um, so upon, upon disembarkation in what would become the US, all were sold, though only an estimated 400,000 disembarked from West and West Central Africa. Uh, millions were moved to the intra and interstate slave trades, which persisted after the British ended the slave trade in 1808. Um, and sale was often akin to death. So here you see um, an ad advertisement, again, thinking about uh, the dehumanizing processes of the Americas and what that means for the creation of ideas of blackness and how the idea of the slave is foundational to what blackness is and how uh, contemporary racial hierarchies develop in the Americas. Um, and so you see here, it's, it's just, it's an advertisement for people. Um, and here, uh, sale, thinking about sale often being akin to death, um, you know, it, laws like the Fugitive Slave Law reduce the likelihood that escaped loved ones would ever see or visit anyone they loved again. So questions of enslaved humanity lay at the heart of the very institution of slavery, with new concepts like race emerging both via religious substantiation and as, you know, so we're using religious logics to say race exists. But also race itself, I argue, becomes a religious category. Um, it becomes this idea that there's something immutable and foundational and uh, divine and intrinsic about race um, in this moment. So moving to, you know, very quickly, so kind of giving you that quick kind of history of how, you know, this movement and thinking about slavery and now kind of marrying that to the religious, um, through the signification of captive bodies as religious outsiders, Christians author Christian authorities sanctioned human trafficking amid these discourses on rights and the decline of European, uh, European feudalism. So of course, very famously in 1455, there's a papal bull re regarding Guinea, which is what the term for, um, that was used for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Pope Nicholas V famously granted King Alfonso of Portugal license to quote, invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue, end quote, Muslims and pagans, and quote, to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Okay. Uh, four decades later, the Treaty of Tordesillas, uh, which is, this is the uh, historical map of what that looked like. And I, my favorite thing to show my students is like, how much is not in the map, you know? And, and it just kind of disrupts this idea that, you know, Western Europeans knew the world that they were trying to uh, explore. It just, it, I, I love historical maps for that reason. Uh, so four decades later, the Treaty of Tordesillas, which is pictured here, uh, divided the world between Spain and Portugal, and of course affirmed Christians' divine rights to land and people. These notions of enslavability often depended upon narratives of atypical humanity that were often gendered. And so here in my book, this is one of uh, the many interventions I, I'm making, which is layering gender into the racial story of slavery. Uh, not only gender, but gender and religion into the racial story of, of slavery in the Americas. So as Western Europeans econ economy, as Western European economies grew increasingly dependent upon West and West Central African labor, Prejudice ruminations of the so-called on the so-called natural roles and performances of males and females substantiated claims of Africans' fitness for enslavement in these racializing discourses. Unsurprisingly, women's childbearing and child rearing practices were frequently marshaled as evidence of the innate enslavability of African descended people. In his account of the Gold Coast, one Dutch traveler surmised that the women of the region never lie to bed for a month nor use midwives to, quote, put them into the child bed and to make them feel comfortable, quote, as uh, Dutch, end quote, as Dutch women did when birthing. Instead, African women, in his words, just walked away and drank a mixture of oil and grain following childbirth. I always say, spoken like someone who never gave birth to any. <laughs> uh, but according to this traveler, uh, this shows that, quote, 
The women here are of a cruder nature and stronger posture than the females in our lands in Europe. For the very day after giving birth to the child, they go and walk again in the streets and do their things just like the other women as if nothing happened. Uh, and he also linked West African children's physical prowess to women's child rearing practices. So it's not just child birthing, it's how they're raising their children, asserting that the children uh, in, in uh, the Gold Coast speak and walk much earlier than our children, our being uh, children, uh, Dutch children, uh, on account of the practice of their mothers paying the, ch the children little attention and allowing them to crawl and walk about. So you can see these same, those, these are very, uh, early uh, instances of a very con a, a, a strain about maternity that continues into the contemporary moment. Um, and as historian uh, Jennifer Morgan has very famously shown, perceptions of West African women's cruder nature and stronger posture in regards to childbearing and child rearing really shape, uh, shape racial discourses via the trope of what she calls meaningless and mechanical childbearing that populated a lot of uh, early traveler uh, accounts. So travelers peddled these racist images of African and indigenous women breastfeeding their children over their shoulders alongside discourses of their excessive fecundity to offer evidence uh, of these women's um, uh, unique suitability for intense manual labor. Okay, so Morgan is making this case about both. And if you look at both records, you see if there really is very distinct, until we get to De Las Casas, we don't have a lot of distinction between how um, how African women are being imagined in the Western European imagination and how indigenous women are being imagined. They're usually being kind of lumped together. Their bodies are being analyzed for how they walk, their, um, their breasts, uh, how they carry their children. Everything is fair game in these uh, racializing accounts. So interestingly, uh, in the discourses that circulated around the Atlantic, it was the women's alleged ability to give birth without pain and breastfeed without effort that located them outside the curse of Eve. So going back to the Christian narrative, oh, this cur the curse of Eve very famously pre presented in the first book of the Hebrew Bible or the Christian and also the Christian Bible. Um, and in the absence of this pain, so again, perception that there is no pain, African females were not women within the Abrahamic gender mythology. So there's a different racialization and gendering are happening at the same time, or gendered conventions are giving access to different ways of racializing bodies. Um, so as now women captain females could be subjected to all kinds of forms of labor, spectacular acts of violence and reproductive imperatives that would have been beyond the pale for European descendant women. And so when you couple this with things like the curse of Ham, this idea that uh, African descendant people were do divinely ordained since Christian biblical times to serve their European descendant counterparts, uh, it really becomes clear how the operation of race or enslavement depended upon the operation or creation of race in accordance with religious logics. Uh, and these logics were proclaimed to be both historical, which is rooted in, uh, in historical being re rooted in this idea of uh, kind of hit Christian historicity, timeless historicity. Um, and then also they were being historicized in the moment through these discourses and through the imagery that was circulating. So this was gendered imagery that contributed to the notion of enslavability uh, of Afri the enslavability of African descended humans, not just all humanity. There, were, there was something different happening here. And this formed the foundation for racial hierarchies in the Americas and later globally. And, it, and not only that, it powered the region's economic and political appearance on the global stage, particularly when we talk about the United States. We can talk about that more in Q&A. I'm just gonna keep moving, um, but I do have more to say about that because I don't think that's, it's particularly in what would become the United States, but uh, I think in different ways in uh, places like Brazil, uh, which is why they got so many people uh, as some of you and many of you might already be familiar. So for me, um, here's the question. And, and this is me kind of cruxing the historical part and kind of, I mean, cresting the historical part and kind of flowing into thinking about the questions that I want us to consider in our conversation. Um, all of those doing, you know, for me, I think all of us who are doing work uh, narrating the lives of violated human subjects, 
we're, we're, we're kind of compelled to ask a method, methodological question, which that is, how do we narrate the humanity of people designated um, in, in any way, you know, in derogatory ways in the historiography, but for my purposes as slaves in histories of the Americas. More specifically, how do we demarcate our categories? And in my case, I'm thinking about the category of religion and access interiority among pre-colonial, colonized and violated people using the very intellectual apparatuses that have been integral to historical acts of violence and colonialism. Um, so again, a reflexive kind of move that has preoccupied me not only in this project, but in future projects. So thinking about these intellectual apparatuses specifically modes of categorization, ways of defining religion, and of producing knowledge, um, they have not only authorized historical violence, but also enforced a type of intellectual colonialism that shapes how the cultures of historically marginalized subjects is translated into knowledge in academic uh, and broadly public historical spaces. So consequently, as a consequence of these gestures, um, some historical subjects are more legible than others quite simply. Um, and this legibility often corresponds to the subject's proximity to the center from which, from which so-called history emanates. So for me, the center is both embodied and epistemological, um, not only just how knowledge is defined, but also who gets to define what we consider historical knowledge. Um, moreover, whose bodies, experiences, and epistemologies are marginalized recolonized and erased in the process of us doing the defining and historicizing. Um, so again, it's a conversation in my head that I'm inviting everyone into. Um, and so as a historian who is studying religion among enslaved African descendant people, uh, particularly uh, women gendered people, these are the methodological and theoretical questions that preoccupy my research and teaching. Is it possible to apprehend the religiosity of a people whose very appearance as Negroes and Africans in modernity was predicated upon Western Christian, Christian epistemes that normalize these human hierarchies alongside the categorization of new plants, animals, and geographies. So long question, um, but essentially it's how do, we, how do we continue to write? Should we continue to write and think with apparatuses that are central to the colonization of the subjects we're engaging? Um, and if, if the answer is no, then what do we put in its, pro in, in its place? If the answer is yes, we have no other choice, then how do we continue to access these people in ways that, are, that honor their humanity and the ways that they were trapped within these discourses and, and really remade and violated through these discourses that we're using and apparatuses? Um, and so how do I access the religious psyches of these people? Um, you know, the religious psyches of people created, you know, in the, the, in the intellectual sense by the very violent tools that I'm using to understand them. Um, and so here, you know, very quickly, I want to turn to a case study of an enslaved woman's uh, religiosity to kind of model, and this will be a very brief case study as, as I wind down, um, to model the methodological tools uh, through which I, I rendered their experiences legible, but I think there's a lot of conversation happening around, uh, now that's really exciting um, that helps us understand many ways to render these experiences legible. Um, so these tools are rooted in historical experiences of the body and the mundane and show with brutal clarity the relationship between um, the, the kinds of tools we use to create these histories and the lived experiences of those we are, are trying to animate through them. Um, and so uh, here I have, this is the only slide with the text, and uh, I wanted us to actually see an actual source. Um, one of the, the few sources we have with enslaved uh, African descendant women speaking, and this source, as you can see, is comes from 1936. So this is a part of the Federal Writers Project out of Georgia. I used a lot of these sources um, because so enslaved women are speaking in so few sources in the colonial and antebellum archive, uh, Anglophone archive, let me, because uh, 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 Hispanophone archives, they do speak more. Um, and that's mostly through legal records. But uh, I, I chose not to, to use those because I was studying the low country. And so here, 
um, you see, uh, you can just kind of read through, you just see the kind of back and forth in the structure of many of these conversations. So this is um, one from Nancy Boudry, but um, uh, because the one for, that I'm reading from here, they did not have an actual, the transcript from hers is not available through the Library of Con Congress digitally. Um, but Carrie Nancy Fryer reported that all her children, as she said, grew up straight because she swept them nine times for nine mornings from the knee down, that away, and bathed them with pot liquor and dishwater. She also reported that she used sassafras to make blood purging teas in the spring and administered water from a horse trough to, to cure a whooping cough. Moreover, when she did not possess the ritual and medicinal repertoires to address a problem, she addressed, uh, entrusted the care of her children to other women who did. So Nancy's daughter um, was born with a win, which was a boil uh, that was in her words, as big as an apple. When an old healing woman came to get Nancy's daughter to take her to the corpse of a, a lady that had died the same morning, Nancy did not want her child to go to what she called the death house, but relinquished her child anyway. The elderly woman apparently passed Nancy's daughter across the corpse nine times and then down the corpse an additional nine times in the process curing the child of her win. In response to the memory, Nancy declared matter of factly that there quote, ain't no use talking. She, and she thinking about the elderly woman who cured her child, straightened my child, her and the Lord. And she concluded her recollection with a word on the protocols that rendered the ritual efficacious saying, quote, you gotta do it before the corpse gets cold, just after the breath passes out of the body, end quote. So I, I'm using this, I, I, I'm highlighting this because I want to underscore the fact that these women, this is considered, I mean, I think there are lots of ways we can categorize what we're hearing. We can talk, say, oh, it's just a superstition, which is what they was characterized by people like the interviewers doing the, um, the uh, federal right uh, conducting interviews for the federal writers project. Uh, so, so we might say religion, we might say medicine, or we might just completely dis disregard it. Um, but I want to underscore the fact that these women's religious cultures are neither absent nor hidden in the sources, but rather rendered largely illegible by definitions of what religion is. And these definitions privilege theology over cosmology systematization over improvisation and intellectualism over sensuality in definitions of religion. So doing so renders religious uh, practices like these largely illegible, um, but in order to render them legible, it requires an attentiveness to the material realities of enslavement that shape these performances, as well as uh, to quote anthropologist Elizabeth Pettis, the stylized expression of sentiment corporeal regimes, affective registers, and the culturally specific configuration of sensory faculties and apprehensive modalities called the sensorium. It's a beautiful quote, very long. <laughs> um, but um, the sensorium, like she's talking about so much. I just want you to, even if you hear the term, the sensorium, it's, it's just, it, I think it evokes everything that she's trying to describe. Um, we have to begin to study the sensorium and, and, I, and marry that idea to the, uh, to the material realities to really get a definition of religion that allow, renders these cultures legible. And so these types of religions bespoke the rigors of child rearing and slavery that required maternal figures to acquire knowledge of medicinal and spiritual therapies for common ailments and the centrality of these women to the transmission of ritual pharmacological and cosmological ideas to members of the community. And I'll just say as, as an aside, enslaved children died at twice the rate of their white counterparts. So, and, and if we look at one year, we don't have a lot of data, but between 1849 and 1850 alone, enslaved children under the age of nine accounted for over half of the deaths among uh, African descendant people in seven slaveholding states. So think about that. One year alone, they're over 50% of the, all the people dying, um, despite uh, constituting only a, a little over a quarter of the, the population. Okay, so we're talking about astronomical numbers of, of uh, child mortality. Um, and those numbers get higher when we talk about maternal mortality. So nestled in accounts like these is not only evidence of a more, uh, of what I would argue a religious system, but also concern for children, fear for your child's safety, a desire to see your child live, a resourcefulness born in community. Um, 
And so it just, it, it, these, these uh, child mortality st st statistics um, are not unrelated to religious studies and to history, but rather remind us of how notions of religion have been marshaled to demarcate the so-called primitive from the civilized to racialize and hierarchicalize human bodies and to legitimate this enslavement through a narratives of Christian beneficence and human progress. Um, and so what, what I'm saying here is they've never, they're not, these methods, these categories we use have, are not now and have never been benign. Instead, they have had real and often deadly historical consequences for the people upon whom they are predicated. And beyond that, they have elicited a response from those people that I would characterize as religion in, in many instances. Um, so to conclude, I wanna leave us with this image. Um, in the spirit of this talk, my objective here has not been to kind of tie up my thoughts into a neat bow. Those who know me will know it's just never possible. <laughs> it's just not how I think. Um, in fact, I'm, all, I'm actively resisting the urge to create a cohesive narrative in favor of a series of questions and provocations inspired by the historical subjects that I study. Um, the lives of the people I study, the enslaved people, cannot be disentangled from sociologists and philosophers and anthropologists and historians and others and who render them marginal. Not only, you know, history alone has not rigid, you know, historical processes alone have not rendered them marginal. Our ways of thinking and writing render them marginal as well. Um, so attention to the material conditions of historical bodies, those of our canonized theorists, those of ourselves and others offers, I think, a first step towards humanizing those whose experiences and bodies have been marginalized and violated across space and time. Grounded in historical realities, real stories, real lives, theorists and knowledges are, and, and theorists and the knowledges you know, we create are held accountable and notions of a center, uh, and by that I mean of modes of relationality that render some essential and universal or some marginalized and localized and others more universal are revealed not only to be unstable, but also untenable. Uh, and equally importantly for those of us who study these people, I think grounding in material realities forces scholars and, and those of us who think and engage this material to reckon with how these non-canonical, non-intellectual voices and orientations speak back to the canon. They speak back to us in historical spaces and time. Um, thinking about enslaved women, the violence of their realities, you know, the violence of the passage that, the violence of that movement um, required their religions to be survival oriented. It required it to be practical, but it, in understanding it as such, we do not extract the very real intellectual and, and ethical work that they were doing in these practices. I think we just have to ask different questions of the practices. Um, the definitions of religion they lived and espoused were shaped by the rigors of their physical and social environment and by the violence, physical and discursive, perpetrated against them and their children. Um, Nancy may not have been aware of these protocols that she used, you know, the one who was kind of Give it, gave her child to a healing woman uh, before that older woman took it. However, in the aftermath of the encounter, she possessed an understanding of the proper execution of a healing rite that she didactically relayed to an interviewer and no doubt to the daughter who was cured and other members of the community. And so this for me is an example of an, a mundane woman transmitted non-institutional mode of religiosity that only becomes legible only through a decentering of these decontextualized concepts of what religion is or what history should be. Um, and then by bringing these voices into academic conversations, it just reminds us, I think, also of the potential uh, of historical, for historical and intellectual violence um, in the kinds of theories and methods and narratives we bring into our classrooms and into spaces where we're discussing this, specifically the capacity for thoughts to erase and violate people in historical time and memory. So in short, I'm really just trying to model an approach to humanizing, which I would argue is inherently messy, just as colonialism and enslavement were are messy. Um, and so my questions are, what does this look like in practice? 
How do we create frameworks through which we wrestle with the messy historical legacies that render certain identities and bodies illegible um, as interlocutors, historical, theoretical, you name it, while also contouring the parameters of their thought within our respective fields? How does humanizing the historically dehuman dehumanized require a reorientation of purpose and what it means to do scholarly work? And so to conclude, I just, I wanna leave you with this image uh, and invite you to sit with it and consider how her thoughts, history and interiority remake how we think of blackness, humanity and the history of the Americas. So thank you. And I look forward to your uh, questions. No, oh, wait, I can't hear anyone. Oh, you're on mute. Are we on mute now? Yes? Yep. Oh, okay. Wonderful. There was a round of applause in the room, which I hope you heard. <laughs> but I did want to thank you also, Alexis, for, for giving us a glimpse uh, that we, I think these are memorable moments in this kind of uh, um, seminars of, of your own private life uh, and, and, and the grace with which you, you talked to your child and, and gave us a look <laughs> at that uh, beautiful moment. So thank you for that. Um, so, so we do have, um, you know, time for a few questions. Uh, I don't know if we can maybe start in the room, but if there is questions on the YouTube channel, please post them in, in the channel there. So please uh, go ahead if you have questions. Alexis? Yes, no? I mean, I just have an observation. So Professor- Can you, can you speak up a little bit maybe without the, yeah. Your work is so inspiring and beautiful. And I think that the, that the call for humanizing the slave, the slave is, is just such a, an important um, call that we, we really receive very in our hearts and the work that you do is incredibly inspiring. Um, I wanted to ask in terms of humanizing, so the experiences that you can read through the materials that you study are a lot about everyday lives, right? Um, so I want to hear a little bit more about religion. I, don't, I know this is not the topic that you want to talk about right now, but it's also a way to humanize him. So just a, a very short um, uh, reflection on that part, which I, I, I also find fascinating. Yes, thank you for that question. Yeah, I, 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 you, you asked a religious studies scholar who talked so little. About <laughs> um, yeah, so, so usually, so it's um, in the book, what I do, and I, I can talk about what I'm doing now in the next book, because I think very similar, what you got was kind of a template of how I think about religion and kind of the many factors I used to think about it. Um, but in the book in particular, when we talk about humanizing, and like you said, the everyday, so um, reproduction is very central to what I think about. And so, for instance, in one of the chapters thinking about ethics, um, I think about things like suicide and abortion, contraceptives. Um, I think about everything from you know, that's kind of much more of the, um, I would say the more kind of high profile things, particularly given where we are in reproductive politics in the contemporary moment, but it, it was very mundane for them. You know, the control of thinking about reproduction being scaled up to this level of something that has to be surveilled. Um, it's not a new concept. If you look across cultures, you know, it's, that's why reproduction is so scary and, and you know, female power is so scary. Uh, because it is so powerful and foundational to how cultures and communities grow. So if there's something happening there, then it, it can be detrimental to the entire community. Um, but in particular, for these people, um, they were not, 
yet in the mode of relinquishing their power to uh, a, a to an external body to regulate whether or not they reproduce uh, because that's never been a part of within their purview and so I, I talk about things like um, uh, a, a very uh, a very well documented case of an enslaved woman uh, they don't know we don't know if she actually killed her child or if the child was stillborn or if you can't tell um, but this is why midwives were so foundational. And I think about them as central uh, religious figures because midwives not only possess medicinal and pharmacological knowledge, but they also were in these intimate spaces where life and death happened because not only were they oftentimes in these birthing spaces, they were also in uh, the sick rooms. Those were the primary people who took care of sick people, uh, enslaved or not. Um, and so they were at these really critical junctures in um, human experience. And because of that, they possessed a lot of knowledge, um, some of which was very personal and intimate and some of it, which was just kind of purely medicinal. Um, and so I think about these kinds of moments, I think about them as religious authorities, you know, ritual authorities, as I, I talk about, um, and think about like these practices, if we situate them within the material realities, uh, of enslavement, then you can understand why filicide is an ethical act for a number of enslaved women. If we extract the material conditions, you don't know as much about slavery, then I think it's easy to impose our contemporary understandings of what their lives were, and then to understand what, what they were doing. And so those that's kind of one example. I look at ritual, um, I look at ethics, um, power, uh, in, in the book, um, kind of big religious studies categories. But the reason I look at them as religious studies categories is because I, I want to invite my readers to understand religion beyond Abrahamic traditions, which is usually the template that people are using uh, to understand what religion is, because we're dealing with groups of people many of whom were Muslim. So we have like over 20% were likely Muslim. So that's the, but that's, and then we have Congo, uh, the people from uh, Congo speaking region who would have already had exposure to Christianity and some may have converted. But beyond that, you don't have a lot of people. They're, they're working with different theological <laughs> systems. So why are we imposing you know, these frameworks upon how they think. And so I, I'm trying to think within a deconstructed way about religion, how, what religion is and how it shows up. But to your point, it's also very mundane. It's very, it's very much in how people make decisions. Because when we think about, you know, religion beyond tradition, beyond what happens in so-called religious spaces, how do people enact religiosity? You know, they do it in it's everyday things that they do to show their devotion or to, to demonstrate their, how they situate themselves. Um, and so I was much more curious about those everyday, especially since those institutional cultures were um, spaces that were less occupied by enslaved people. We have like um, a statistic that only 22% maybe would have professed Christianity at the start of the civil war. And that's a big question mark. And that's being incredibly generous as well. Um, so the vast majority are not Christian. And um, the, the, by that point, the Muslim po population, most of the Muslim population is gonna go to places like Brazil. Um, and so, uh, but we do have pockets in the low country, but they're, they're still not large. And so we're, we're left with people who are working off of uh, Africana religious epistemologies. And so that's why I chose to kind of issue um, uh, kind of understandings that are more rooted in institutions and really adopt much more of a religious studies method methodology, which is thinking about big structures that compose religions versus like the um, kind of the more in nuanced and institutional structures of religion. So um, yeah, that, yeah, that's kind of one example of what I'm thinking about. But like, I also talk about fun stuff like myth um, <laughs> and, and kind of, you know, their belief, a lot of animals are in their, their Genesis mythology. Um, birds are very strong in their mythology. How the world comes to be is, is through, or how the world will end is through uh, a bird. Every Friday would have been today at one o'clock, a bird takes a stick and, and, and flies somewhere. And when finally the sticks are all gone, the world ends, you know, and so there are lots of really, 
Um, and and in, in to that point, a lot of uh, West African animals show up in the mythology in the Americas. Um, so it's evidence that they're taking and adapting. Um, they're still connected, but they're, they're, they're adapting them to new situations. And so they talk about the Lord when they're talking about this bird, but then they're also talking about chimpanzees, you know, and humans kind of evolving from chimpanzees and then owls uh, are the old women and, you know, you know, women who have power can t switch between being an owl and a human. I mean, there are just lots of things that they're talking about um, that give us kind of a sense of the old world and the new. So there's a, I'm sorry, I, I'm trying to remember more. <laughs> no, that's that's really funny. <laughs> I, I, you know, yeah. We have time probably for one more question. Oh, I'm I, sorry, I took too long. I, I do have one question myself, uh, so so maybe I'll ask my question and uh, you you can decide not to answer it. But I I was so taken by this idea of the epistemologies that we have, like we carry with us and we we see the the world through those eyes. So the reason I I want to ask you this, and, and you can't tell me you haven't watched the movie or you don't uh, care about it, but I was talking with the academic consultant for the Warrior King movie, the Warrior the the the, the Woman King movie. With Viola Davis, and he told me that he spent the last three months having to argue with all sorts of news outlets of why the movie is true. I mean, he basically says, I have to argue that these women existed, that these women had were warriors, that these women were, and, and he said it's impossible when a white historian has already written a book denying it. So so he was really like telling me about, and he's from Benin, you know. Uh, so so I wonder if you have any thoughts on this. How do you fight this up here battle or have you watched the movie? <laughs> no, yeah, I, I actually have not seen the movie. I it, like I am I am in the trenches with my children being sick. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. My kids are sick every single week. Okay? <laughs> so uh, and that has been the case for like literally we're on week what eight where our, one of our kids is home. Um, and my, my partner travels for work all the time so is not here to assist um so i yeah i have not seen the movie unfortunately but i do think that to your point it's a it's great evidence of kind of the structures and and the historiography like the violence of the historiography so even when we're trying to excavate new histories there are different ways that these colonial structures continue to reassert themselves um and, and like who's written the book the book, you know, whose who's authority matters? Um, and what have they said? What kind of, and, and you know, I, it's, it's, it's hard to tell um, people who aren't academics that the, the question matters. Like we can approach the same set of sources and get them out with two different things that could be equally true given whatever our question is, you know? And so it's, it's hard to explain that we have been asking some of the same questions over and over again, and our questions have emanated out of these colonial structures, which means that we have yielded colonial histories, even when we're claiming not to do so. Um, and so that that's kind of, um, you know, I, I always say I have the, the problem of not being able to think past whatever I am thinking with at thinking about at the moment. So that's why I, I can't, it's hard for me to talk about the, the souls of women folks because I'm like, well, I'm doing something else now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I try to bridge the two, but I mean, this is the soul, I think the thing the souls of women folk and all, everything I'm working with right now are all doing is trying to um, think very intentionally about the questions I'm asking about my sources and the categories yeah. I'm using. So the category of religion to, to my last, last answer, I want it to be a category that is indigenous to the people I'm studying. So what does religion mean to an enslaved person? Is this a category they would recognize? And if they did, what would they put in it? Um, versus kind of what does religion mean to a field which is innately anchored with the, to these colonial regimes uh, because of how religion comes into academic existence or it comes into to common usage, which also is happening at this moment. You know, um, because religion itself is not a distinguishable category really before the 16th century. People don't really understand religion in this way as we do now. Um, and so just, just thinking about religion and race um, all and, and slavery and colonialism all growing up in the same cauldron, uh, what kinds of 
intellectual legacies does that produce? And what imperative do we have as scholars to undo those if we're saying that we're studying these regions of the place of the world where these things happen? Um, so those are the kinds of questions I'm asking of myself. And I think it, that's the reason why the scholar from Benin is getting this constant pushback because we have not been, I think as historians and anthropologists, we have not been critical enough of ourselves. We're, mm -hmm. We think we're just by studying the people we're doing the work. And it's, it's not that, you know, we have to also be, you know, studying the people and, and inverting the categories, you know, and mm -hmm. thinking with new categories and proposing new categories so that when others come in, these people like the woman king are legible because she's just not legible within the categories that have been bequeathed to the people um, who, who have understood uh, that region of the world. So, um, or are trying to understand that region of the world. So I haven't seen it, but um, I do, I, I, I hope to see it at some point. <laughs> yeah. all the time. Thank um, you, Alexis. Yeah, but thank you so much. This has been fun. I'm sorry I went so long. I thought we ended at three o'clock. So that's, I pitched it. <laughs> no, 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 thank you so much. So we are, um, we just listened to Professor Alexis Wells Ogogomi. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Do, do tune in on Friday, November 4th. So this is in two weeks time. We will have Professor Pedro Regalado uh, continuing in this series of reflections about the, the Afro-descendant uh, in different ways uh, within our Latin American series. But thank you so much again for coming to us. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. We can watch the movie tonight. <laughs> I'm... <laughs> the 